Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you and God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Where my bad is. Not on me this time. Check, check. There we go. All right, let's try this again. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's probably not that big of a surprise when I tell you that I stumble into a lot of weird theological assumptions online. I guess it's kind of my fault. I don't go looking for it, but I do go to the places where I know it's going to pop up. And I guess it kind of goes with the job description to call out errors where I find it. And if nothing else, it gives me these anecdotes to open up my sermon. So I guess you get to benefit from it at least. So it is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I stumbled upon an online discussion on whether or not Jesus was a communist. Uh, that's actually not the weird part. That one pops up a lot. Uh, but the reason this has earned its place in the archive that me and my former classmates share, or we, we kind of compile all the weird stuff we find online, is that uh, one of the commentators on this thread said that, that the answer is no, because I quote, Communism and socialism have altruism as their basis. Altruistic morality says you should be concerned with the needs of everyone else before your own. However, Jesus' parables talk about how it's in your own best interest to seek and love God. So I, I kind of like broke my brain a little bit, but I had to call him out because surely he couldn't be saying that the core of Christianity is selfishness, over altruism, so I had to like double check and say, you're not saying what I think you're saying. But indeed, he did double down on this. He said that love your neighbor as yourself is really a reminder to make sure that you really, really love yourself so that you can effectively love others, I guess. Uh, the promise that the first shall be last and the last shall be first was a reminder that you should seek to humble yourself now for the sake of of earning that greater reward for yourself later. Let greed motivate your own humility. After all, according to this person, the only reason Jesus laid down his life and died on the cross for us was so that he would go on and be exalted and receive a name above every other name and all the accolades that Paul mentions he receives after his ascension. So according to this guy, I guess Gordon Gekko was making a dogmatic statement when he declared, Greed is good. So if you're wondering where my, my tolerance for nonsense is before my brain breaks and I just can't even begin to figure out where to begin, it's about there. <laughs> and while I imagine that most people probably won't go as far as this guy did in outlining and confessing a theology of selfishness, I fear that this is, to some degree, a fairly common foundation of much of American Christianity. Independent, individualistic, and all about me. I have decided to follow Jesus, we say. Well, we don't because we're Lutherans, but other denominations do. And I suspect a lot of the times the unspoken closing of that statement isn't so much because it's true or because it's the right thing to do, but so I can get that big fancy mansion in the sky. Jesus as a self-help model is a common topic for Mega church sermons, as Joel Osteen encourages millions of people to remember, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do, and I will never be the same. After all, we all know American Christianity is about your personal relationship with Jesus as you just sit in your own spot in the pew. The church is just kind of a social club and collection of individuals rather than a community, not responsible for nor reliant upon anyone else. Just me and my Bible, here to download the information given from the pulpit into my own 
personal edification and right out the door to see what's next on my to-do list. Christianity is about pulling yourself up from the bootstraps, right? It's about having that strong Protestant work ethic so you don't have to rely on the charity of others. God helps those who help themselves, after all. A quote that 80% of Christians polled think is an actual quote from the Bible. Because really it is all about how you personally can be improved and what you can get out of it after you've earned your reward. Now I am being somewhat hyperbolic to make a point here, and of course some of those things are denomination specific to other congregations. But the fact remains that our sinful nature always strives to make us look inward and focus only on ourselves and, quite frankly, our American culture, which emphasizes individuality and independence, doesn't do us much favors in this regard. So I remind you, one of the classic phrases used throughout church history to describe sin is incurvatus in se, man turned in on himself. Not only in the sense of placing your own desires above the needs of others or making an idol of the things you want beyond what God has commanded, but in also ignoring those around you, isolating yourselves from all others. It is reducing everything to the question of what can I get out of this? It's being unaware of your neighbor's needs and not even caring that you have that blindness. It's always focusing on making sure that you are entirely taken care of before you deign to share any of your scraps with the others. And then it's using whatever good works you do as a means to an end to get yourself a better reward in heaven, rather than seeing the people you might help as ends unto themselves. It is the pride of thinking you don't need anyone else's help, and it is the despair of thinking that nobody will help you and thus denying your neighbor the opportunity to show you a work of love when you, by not sharing your burdens with your church family. And so against our own selfish nature now comes John's guidance on how we ought to be walking in the light. Amazingly, John, 1 John 3.16 reflects and reminds of, of the same message of the ever-popular John 3.16, that Christ has laid down his life for our sake. He has died and paid the penalty for our sins of selfishness and putting our own wants above his commands. He did not do this to make us into a stepping stone so he could go on to exaltations and glorification for himself in heaven, as my online foe attested, but only out of love for his own creation. He did it to restore that relationship that was broken between man and God by sin. He considered our needs greater than his own, which is the biblical definition of love. And so he sacrificed himself to pay the debt that we never could pay, adopting us into the family of God, that we now may walk in the light, as John has bid us do at the start of this epistle. And remember that before Jesus did all of that sacrificial work on the cross, he gave us that mandate by which we name Maundy Thursday, that we ought to love one another as he has loved us. And I know our world out there tries to define love as you know, being generically nice and not hurting anyone's feelings, but the scriptures make it clear what love really means. It does mean altruism. It does mean considering others before yourself, of sharing what you have, of even being willing to die for another's sake as the greatest expression of love as Jesus showed God's love for us. We who have received God's love, who are now called to walk in the light, do that by reflecting that light out into the world, showing the love that the Father has already shown us unto our neighbors. Acts of love, then, while not a means to earn our way into heaven or merit salvation, remain absolutely necessary for God's people. For as John says, how can we say that we dwell in the love of God if we do not likewise love those whom God has put into our lives, whom God has also died for? How can God's love abide in us if we ignore those around us and close our hearts to them? To abide in God and his love is to reflect his love out. 
and yet we still have trouble knowing how to love. You can blame our sinful human nature, you can blame our culture, whatever you want, but we always misunderstand what it is to love. Again, we confuse love with niceness. We fall into that narrative that saying or doing something that, might, that someone else will disagree with or be offended by is unloving. Or we might get the right sense of that self-sacrificial understanding of what love is, but we still make excuses for ourselves. Again, we often hear, I need to learn how to love myself before I can love others. Which really is just a nicer way of saying, I must indulge in my own selfishness before I can become selfless. Yet, as Pastor Wolf Mueller pointed out in the book we just finished in our Sunday morning class, we already know how to love ourselves. We already know how to see to our own needs without even really thinking about it. You know, when I'm thirsty, I get up and I go get myself a drink. When Lydia tells me that she's thirsty, I tell her she needs to wait until I get to a stopping point or whatever I'm doing, and it's more convenient for me to do something for someone else. I say I love her, but that's not the most loving way to go about it. But this is that third use behind the law that God has given us. It teaches us how to love. The Ten Commandments are not just an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts. They are an instruction manual for how creation has been designed to function. So when Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself, he is merely summarizing the Ten Commandments, but when you go and you read the Ten Commandments, they flesh out what he has just said. And if you read the whole book of the law, that fleshes it out even more. So how do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, that's the first three commandments. You worship him alone. You use his prayer for prayer. You use his name for prayer, praise, and giving thanks, never to curse, swear, lie, or deceive. And you do not despise his word, but you gladly hear, learn, and keep it. How do you love your neighbor as he has commanded you to do? That's the rest of them. How are, You reflect the love he has lavished upon you by respecting the authorities God has placed in your life and exercising whatever authority you have responsibly. By not hurting, but caring for your neighbor's physical needs. By loving appropriately. By not robbing your neighbor, but helping your neighbor keep and maintain his property. By not gossiping, but putting the best construction on everything and seeking to protect your neighbor's reputation. And by not coveting, but aiding your neighbor in caring for his house and business. None of it for your own sake, none of it because you have to earn brownie points with God, but all of it in response to what God has already done for you. For John is sure to remind us, even in the midst of what is a fairly law-heavy portion of the text, that when we do stumble into this, when we do fall into sins of omission so that our selfish hearts might condemn us, God remains faithful to his word. He remains greater than our sinful hearts and his forgiveness still stands. So that when we do believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, we receive that promise that he won for us on the cross. Salvation is already ours as he has promised, and we, having been made righteous in him, are now privileged to love one another in the way he has commanded us to. The freedom of a Christian is that true, sacrificial, biblical, godly love is now an end unto itself, not a means by which we are striving to earn God's favor more than he's already given it. Or as Luther summarized it, a Christian man is the most free Lord of all, subject to none, a Christian man is most dutiful servant of all, subject to everyone. So let us abide in the Lord, trusting in the word of Christ, knowing that we are forgiven by his great act of love towards us as we live in the reality of the Easter resurrection. And then as the beloved people of God, abiding in him, let us go forth and reflect that love out into the world around us so that the world truly will know that we are his disciples by our love. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Please stand.